Attention PLO order, welcome to another video. This is second thing. The first one was screwed by Detroit. They forgot to add the audio channel. So let's try this again. How to study PLO and how to study and learn it effectively. And we are not going too deep in, into the theory of teaching, learning, studying. But we will scratch the surface and I hope the video gives you some kind of ideas of how you can improve your study process. First, here are a few sentences that I have heard people say when they are asked, how do you study? Or do you study poker? Do you study PLO? Then they say, yeah, I study PLO. I watch Running Twins videos every day. Or you can put any site here. Watching videos daily, all right? Someone has often said that, yeah, I learned a lot by watching Phil Knafon's playing, or I learned a lot by watching Chain Anders playing. I learned a lot watching Kuberi playing. I've even heard that one. I've also heard multiple times that I should have a study plan. And then, of course, my favorite, I learn by playing. And here's my reaction to all of these sentences. They have some truth in them, but I think every one of them is flawed in some way. Let's start with the first one. I watch Running One's videos every day, and that's my study. Well, uh, as you can, or you will find out, you can do videos in many different ways. You can watch them in many different ways. Some of them are more effective than others, but if you watch Run It Once live playing from one of the pros while you're eating your cereals in the morning and watching your Facebook feed, chatting on Twitter and watching the video, then I, I wouldn't say that's learning, that's entertainment. You might learn a bit there, a bit here, but it's not going to make you a PLO mastermind. Then second one, I learned a lot by watching Clafon play. Well, this is the same thing. You can learn a lot when you're watching a coach play and explain. But also, you might watch one hour video and you, you don't learn anything. So, it depends how you do it. The third one, I should have a study plan. Every time when I hear or, or see this one, my initial reaction is, why don't you have it? That's the thing. Every time when people say, I should, the question is, why are you not? I should have a study plan. Well, do it. Why don't you have a study plan? Is there a good reason for it? Or, I should lose weight. Well, do. I should do that. I should do this. Then do it. It's that simple. If you want it. And the last one, I learned by playing you might learn. And what you do learn by playing is you reinforce what you already do. And if you have a lot of good habits, good decisions, then by playing you reinforce them. You get repetitions. Uh, in a few moments you will see why repetitions are important. Problem is that you can always improve your strategy, which means that every one of us, 100% of players, have some flaws in their strategy. And every time you play, you also reinforce those flaws. You reinforce the mistakes, the bad decisions, bad habits. So when you play, pretty much you don't improve much. You just keep grinding on the same level. You have to use your brain. And that takes us to the path of how do we learn? And here's a great picture I found out. Let me just adjust the Detroit camera here. Uh, it's a pyramid of learning. And what it means is the percentage here is approximation of how much we learn from the content that is given to us. Normally it's retention rates. And of course, it's not absolute truth, it's just a pyramid that shows you the important thing. 
first one is lecture, and and this is the live lecture le lecture you attend on university or high school. You go there, you sit down, you listen for the hour, and you get out. You might be motivated, you might not be motivated. That's the worst worst possible way of learning. When you start to read yourself something, it's more effective. When you have audiovisual presentation like we have here, it's a bit more effective demonstration when I show you something. Like poker or PLO strategy video. If I explain you the strategy or how to play paired boards on the flop. If I just do a PowerPoint with text, it's not as effective as if I just show a few hands and I demonstrate how the strategy works. All right. Then we get to the bottom of the pyramid. The first, the first part, the top part is passive teaching methods. And pretty much passive means that the student is doing nothing watches, listens, reads. And then on the bottom, it's more participatory, which means more active. And we get to the discussion group. When you have to discuss the thing, you learn much more. When you start to do the thing, you learn much more. And when you teach it to others, you learn the most. <laughs> and now someone might think that, all right, here's the practice by doing. Doesn't that mean playing? But you just said that playing doesn't teach you anything. Well, yes and no. If you play without thinking, you don't learn. If you play with thinking, you learn. Let's say the topic of paired boards on the flop. You watch strategy video with examples because it's better than without examples. And then you play a session where you focus on paired boards. So every time where there's paired board on your session, you try to remember, or you have your notes, well, not written to your hand, you have some kind of sheet or notepad on your computer, and you see that, okay, what were the basic points of paired boards? What, what's the core of the strategy? And then you start to implement that strategy actively into your game. Then you're practicing by doing. And discussion group is an interesting one because in poker, we have study groups. We're going to talk about study groups in a bit. Almost the same thing from different perspective. Uh, how do we learn another diagram? We learn 10% of what we read, 20% of what we hear, 30% of what we see, 50% what we both see and hear, 70% what's discussed with others. So you can see that once again, the top part, passive methods, bottom part, active methods. When we get active, we learn a lot more. So active versus passive. Passive learning is when you just sit and you watch, listen. You have two senses either your eyes and or your ears. That's passive learning. Active involves thinking. So as soon as you start to use your brain more, it becomes active and you actually do something. And participating involves interaction with others. So as soon as there's at least one other person and you have to interact, that automatically creates activity because you have to think what I am going to say. Even if you just discuss about the strategy video you just watch with your friend, it's way better learning than watching yourself. And this leads to the fact that the more you discuss poker, the more you learn. <laughs> Even if you discuss some simple things like opening ranges, you might know opening ranges, but when you discuss with anyone about the opening ranges, you have to think, you have to process all the information you have, and that teaches you more. You might not learn anything new, but re it reinforces the old knowledge, which makes it better. And I, I will explain later why repetitions are important, even when we know something. 
And you can turn passive watching into active one easily. Here's an example. You're watching Jay Nandes video or Phil Kaufman video or my video or anyone playing who explains their thinking process every now and then. Or even if they don't, you can do this one. And, and to some degree, this works on, on strategy videos too, but mostly for live videos. Every time there's a decision for the player, pause the video. Don't, don't see what happens. Like they open, someone tree bets, the action is back to them. Pause the video and think, what would I do? Would I call? Would I fold? Would I four bet? What would I do with this hand? And then play the video and see what the player did. If he did the same thing, and his reasoning was same as yours, congratulations. If he does something else, listen to his reasoning, and then you have to figure out, does it make sense? And in poker, there are some absolute truths that are just numbers, like mathematics. But then, when there's more variables, it's hard to say absolute truths in mathematics, so we have strategies. And if your strategy is different than the one on the video, it doesn't mean you're wrong. You have a justification for your strategy. On the video, the coach or the player has justification for his strategy. Then you start to think, does it make sense? Does my strategy make sense? It might be that mo both strategies are as fine. Both have the same EV. It's possible. But when you think, is my strategy actually good? I've always done this, but now I hear the perspective of another strategy. It makes more sense. Should I change my strategy? And when you start to do this work, it's very active and, and you learn a lot. But that, that's an easy way to turn normal playing video in the real good learning process. Or you can just watch the video, eat cereals, do some Snapchat and watch up and learn nothing. Up to you. <laughs> Study groups. <clears throat> These were a hot thing a few years ago. Now with the Discord, there are communities and I, I would like to think that a Discord group like PLO Order or uh, most of you are also on Nut Racing's Discord channel. It's sort of study group. Of course, 99% of people are very passive, but you have the opportunity and option to be active. There are strategy discussions. If you post a hand there or ask a strategy question, you will get replies. So it's sort of a study group. Or you can form a new one, go to forum or on the Discord, ask, I play PLO25. Would any, anyone like to join for a study group? Let's learn together. Because when you are in a study group and you use it as it's supposed to be used, it forces you to be active and participating. You don't have to be, but you can be. If you are not, then why are you in the study group? But if you are active and participating, as you just saw, it increases the level of learning by a mile. And that's why study groups are so great. You can discuss there. And even if they discuss about, let's say, you are a bit better player than some other members on the group, and they start to discuss about three betting ranges or opening ranges or how to play flops on certain ports and so on. And you think that, okay, I, I know this shit. Don't skip it. Because teaching and explaining to others is one of the most effective ways of learning. And there's two sides to that. If you teach and explain the things you already know well, then you reinforce what you already know, which is very important. If you teach and explain to others something you don't know that well yet, it forces you to find out, it forces you to think how to present this information so that it's right and people understand and you learn a lot. Like, let's say those there are three people in the study group and they are trying to figure out small blind tree bedding. What they could do is decide that, okay, you, Joe, do a presentation and teach it to, our, to the other two. Then what Joe has to do is to find out 
the small blind tree bedding ranges or what's the tendencies in tree bedding and so on and make a presentation and teach it to others and the thing is that after Cho has done that he has learned a lot about tree bedding from the small blind. The, the, the opportunities are limitless. And as I said, you need to practice things you already know. And the reason is that in poker, time is always your enemy. And, and you have to do things quickly. Let me see, did I have a study? Uh, okay, I don't have that one. Just a second. So I will explain it here. In poker, time is your enemy. And there will be later an example about the implied odds where I explain a bit more truly. But to make decisions fast, you have to do repetitions. And in study groups, you get a lot of repetitions on the things you already know. When you explain it to others, you help other players. That otherwise you wouldn't have those repetitions. I, I would say that if I have, if I had to single out one thing that has affected my PLO the most of, of learning PLO, I would say it was the time when I started to do hand, hand reviews and hand analyzing on poker strategy forum section for PLO hands. So I was with the coach status and I analyzed 10 to 20 hands a day. It was very active back then. What happened is that when I analyzed hand, I had to define ranges. I have to think if the line or the, or the preform with that hand was good. And then I had to figure out whether the line was good one or not but pretty much range definition and opening ranges. Every time when I analyze the hand, I can't repetitions on that. So suddenly, if I did 20 hands a day, then I, I can't five to 600 hands a month without even understanding that I was studying. I just thought that I'm helping people. And I didn't realize back then that, God damn, that was a boot camp for me. I practiced range definition so much back then that it became very natural and automatic for me. And I, I would say that without that, I wouldn't have done the work. So that was a good thing. Uh, study groups come and go. It's natural. Especially if you have a study group, study group on the Skype or on Discord or wherever, there's active people, they are highly motivated. They start a study group, then the motivation always goes down. And when it goes down enough, people start to become passive. And then the study group, at some point, it probably dies. Start a new one, find a new one. So there, there I, I haven't seen a study group that would have run for over years, unless it's, it's multiple people. But I've been in many study groups of three to five people. And they are active for some time, and then they just die. So don't worry about that. You will always find a new one. All right, the study plan that most people should have and not many people have. And the reason is average player is a lazy ass bummer. Most of you watching this video are lazy ass bummer. I am a lazy ass bummer. That's how we go. Average player has more excuses than reasons. And funny thing is that most unpleasant things and projects start tomorrow. I'm going to quit smoking tomorrow, next month. I'm going to start losing weight tomorrow, next week, next month. Rarely I hear that, all right, I'm going to stop smoking now, period. And most players don't love studying. Those who love studying, they are on a fast track to become really good ones. But most players don't, unless the studying is watching videos, which is more like entertainment. But when you have to do work, people don't. 
A uh, good example is I've worked with a few hundred small stakes players over the years uh, as a coach. And those are the most motivated players. I mean, they search for me, they pay money. They are very motivated to learn. Like you guys watching the video, you are very motivated to learn PL. So among those players, on small stakes, 99% of those players, there are a few examples, but pretty much all of them except few ones, had problems in range definition. And we need to define the range to do anything post-flop. So it's the basis of post-flop strategies. So I explained them why range definition is so important. And I show them an easy way to practice range definition. And I say, do five minutes a day. Start with something. And they all agree that, yeah, it's important that I'm going to do it. And then on the next session, I ask them, how much have you practiced range definition? Then 99% of those players have excuses. Or some of them are actually honest and say that I was an lazy ass bummer. I didn't do it. So the thing is, out of the motivated ones, the most motivated people, 99% doesn't do the work if it's not super fun. Because practicing range definition is not sexy, as another coach once said. It's not sexy, it's working. You have to use notepad or write it down. You open a hand, you have to think. It takes time. It's not as fun as playing or doing any other things. So it's a good thing because that's why you can make money in poker. All the information about how to become a great PLO player can be out there, but it's never going to kill the game because 99.9% .9 of all the players are not going to do the work. And most of the motivated ones are not going to do the work. So to overcome this, or some people actually, they're highly motivated, they start and then the motivation dies and they stop. There, there's a lot of people that start projects and never end them. I, I'm sure you know at least one of those persons. Everyone knows those kind of people. They start, they are really good in starting projects and really bad in ending them. So to overcome that, make a study plan. And it, it's easy. It's a schedule where you write down on your calendar on Friday from 12 to 1 a.m. I study. And on the study plan, it says what you study, how you study. It's that easy. <coughs> and <clears throat> my advice is make it an easily achievable instead of hard one. Make it so easy that you can definitely do the hours that you have scheduled. Because then you achieve something. It's easier to increase the hours then start with 20 hours a week and you can only do five. You get this sense of failure and that kills the motivation. When you get the sense of achieving your goals, it increases your motivation. When you get the sense of failing your goals, it kills the motivation. A really good example is, I'm not sure if you have seen the video on YouTube, there's some uh, naval commander giving a speech on graduation ceremony. And, and he says that when, when he's in the army, he, he always, when he wakes up, he makes his bed. And from his students or the soldiers, he demands the same thing. When you wake up, the first thing you do, you make up your bed and you make it up really good. <laughs> and for some, it might seem that, oh, that's, that's stupid. Why would you put so much effort in making up your bed that it's perfect? But he said that when he does that, he knows that he has achieved something. He has done something well. He has done something, done something good. And when he does that, every day starts with him achieving something great. And it's really good view that you can have like, if you do that, you start every day with success. 
because success creates success. Failure creates failure. So make an easily achievable study plan. Right, then after 25 minutes, we get the actual stuff. What to study? Well, I'm not going to tell you exactly what you need to study because I don't know it. But as in any other form of sports, you need to define your needs first. If you want to be a great tennis player and you hire a tennis coach and you ask him, all right, or her, what do I need to practice? How can I become a great? It's impossible to answer unless the coach knows your strengths and weaknesses. And then when the, your needs are defined, they can make a coaching plan, a practicing plan, short term, long term, mid term, whatever. And in poker, it's really hard for anyone else to say what kind of player you are. So you need to make a player profile yourself. I'm going to show you in a bit how. Once you have made the profile, then you can list all possible methods for studying. If you have run it once membership, you have run it once video, you have solver, you have bucket tool, vision, whatever, poker tools, Ultra oracle, whatever. You can list all the possible methods, making calculations, hand reviews, study group discussions, whatever. And the thing is, you have the need, and then you have the methods to fit the needs. Then you build a plan. Then you combine methods with needs and put them on your calendar, and boom, you have a study plan. It's not rocket science. So, the player profile. The idea is to dissect the game into areas and create yourself. And there are no absolute truths or how you have to do it. Um, it's something that I've thought about a lot. Should I make a template? But the problem is that every player is different. For the grading, you, you can use A to F grading, A, B, C, 1, 2, 3, 1 to 5, 1 to 100, whatever works for you. Smileys, I mean, whatever works. And then here's an example. You can dissect pre-flop in to opening ranges, calling ranges, three betting ranges, and calling three bets after opening. And on the flop, you could dissect the strategies into heads up C betting, multi way C betting, and as a pre-flop caller, heads up and multi way. And if you want, you can dissect all the above flop situations to different port textures. Two different port textures, three different, four different, five. I mean, you, you can dissect the game into as small pieces as you, as you want, or as big ones as you want. Here's an example. Imaginary player, imaginary player profile. It's his flop dissecting. And now we can see that here we have dissected the flop into three parts. And then we have overall grade and three different port textures. We could be have locked board texture and then wet board textures and tri board textures, let's say, example. Or we could have high, high, low, high, low, low, and locked boards or whatever. And the player has created himself with A's, B's, and C, where A is, he thinks he is understanding or he is best or, or he's good in those spots or he thinks he knows a lot about those spots he's confident in his game on those spots and here we can see that okay the only area where he has c's is heads up both when he is the pre flop caller so someone opens he calls pre flop there comes the flop that's where he's most un uncomfortable he's not sure what to do with different kinds of hands or instead of flop textures, you could put hands here, try over pairs, mediocre hits, complete air, and wh whatever. You can combine textures with hand buckets and, and you can get as detailed as you want. But here we can see that, okay, he has C's on that one spot. So most likely at the moment, he should focus on the spots where he is a caller in heads of pots. So let's say he has 10 hours a week to study 
probably should put three or four hours to that and then the remaining to the B categories. And then you update the player profile. Then after a month, he might see that, okay, now heads up as a caller and become straight A's because he made so much effort. Now focus on the B's and so on and so on. Because from the profile, you see the areas that you need to study the most. And then use the most of your time on the common spots. So if you have to decide whether I practice pre-flop, flop, turn, or river, I have C's all over the place. The thing is, flop, pre-flop is the most common because pre-flop happens in 100% of the hands. Then out of those, the flop happens in around 30% of your hands. And then the turn is half of those, river is half of those. So 100% of hands play pre-flop, 30% of hands play flop, 15% of hands play turn, and 7% of hands play river. It would be weird to focus only on the river if you have problems on the pre-flop too. Because if you study pre-flop, it helps you in 100% of the hands you play. If you study flop, it helps you in 30% of the hands you play. While focusing on the river, especially very specific river situation like should we raise or call with not flush if there's a straight flush possibility happens once a week or once a session don't put too much effort on that if you have problems on your preflow so what is enough i watched the video i can do it now good example is implied odds. If I made a video about implied odds, so like pot is 50, opponent bets 35, and you have just a flush draw, you don't have immediate odds to call, but if you call how much you need implied odds to justify the call. And I show you a video how to calculate it, it seems easy, and you say that, yeah, I watched the video, I know how to do implied odds. <laughs> well, time limits your decision making. In poker, in most sites, you have 30 seconds to do. Now, if calculating implied odds takes one minute, you can use it. If it takes 15 seconds, it's hard to use because before that, you have to process the pot size, the bet size, do the calculations, think about his range and so on. There's a lot of things you have to think. So we want most of our decisions to be automatic. And automation can be achieved through repetitions. Like preflop. Once you have practiced preflop enough, then on most hands, you know whether it's an open or not. There are some tougher hands, but the more you practice, the more you play, the more automatic it is. Basic flop situations, so on. And the key to play multiple tables is that most decisions are automatic. Some people playing two tables is too much. For some, they play shitloads of tables. I play 12 tables and I still have time to post on the Twitch. I shouldn't, I know, but sometimes I have the Twitch open, I'm watching a stream, I can answer the questions there. Why playing 12 tables? It's not a good thing. Don't do it. Shouldn't do it. But it shows that two repetitions, I have a lot of decisions at automatic level. And automatic level is, if we talk about the theory of learning, it's unconscious competence where your unconscious mind does the decisions for you. So you just know like one plus one, you know it's two. You don't have to take your fingers, I hope, and calculate it. But if I ask you what is 615 plus 1372, you have to think a little, it's not automatic. For a small child, one plus one is not automatic. He takes one finger, processes the information, adds another, and then calculates one, two, oh, it's two. But through repetition, it becomes subconscious, and subconscious mind is very fast. So the example was in Plotot. Once you know how to calculate it, you have to practice it. So it becomes faster and faster and faster. And then when you can do a rough estimation in few seconds, 
then you can use it on the game. And that's the problem that people have. They watch a video about merge trip at range from the small blind. They watch the video, coach explains, it makes sense, I know how to do it, they go to the tables, and they don't do it. You have to practice. You have to practice things you already know to make them faster, 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 more towards the automation. Because the thing is also, when the decisions are made on your subconscious mind, it frees your conscious mind to more, to more complicated thinking processes. And that's when you have more resources to learn new things. If you always focus only on the new things, it's not going to take you far. When you practice new things and you repeat the old things, the combined effect is, is better than just focusing on the new things. All right. Oh, that, that was a hefty 35 minutes about learning. I hope the video gave you some ideas how you can improve your study process. Because every one of you is in PLO order, which means at least you want to learn PLO. Now it's time to ask yourself, what are you going to do to learn PLO? And I hope this video gives you at least one thing that you can make better, because then you have moved forward. And that's the idea. Thanks for the video. Hope you enjoyed. I will see you on the next one. Bye-bye.